for those of you who don't know, Citizens Online has been going for 20 years. We help organizations ensure that the digital age that we now live in doesn't exclude people. My name's James Beecher, I'm research manager. You can find me on Twitter at James D. Beecher. My colleague Francis will be helping manage the chat today. He's at Ludic Tech. And we're delighted to have with us today Shabira Papain from NHSX and Bob Gann, and you can find them on Twitter too. Um, Shabira's name is her Twitter handle and Bob's has an underscore between his first and last name. To very quickly uh, talk about what we're doing today, we'll have some introductions from us. Um, we'll have an overview of health inequalities and digital exclusion. We'll talk about some of the action that's been taken in this time. And then, as I said, the half the session should be time for discussion where you can raise the anxieties and challenges that you're facing at the moment and any resources or tips that you have to share. So before we do that, I'd like to start a poll. Um, we're going to just ask you who's on the call and we have quite a few options here and it's a multiple choice so you can tick whichever of these apply to you so you might be providing remote digital support at the moment you might have been providing digital support before COVID-19 but be unable to at the moment or not have started to do remote digital support you might work in digital inclusion like we do in our charity you might work with people who have low or no digital skills regularly. You might work with people who are marginalized or essentially experience health inequalities in a frontline sense. You might work in digital inclusion around health in particular or in digital health specifically in a sort of frontline sense or as a manager or administrator in health or care on digital transformation in a different sector, or you might just be interested. So I'm sorry, there's quite a few options there, but hopefully it's quick to just tick the ones that apply to you and we can get a sense of who's with us. We've got about half of you have voted now and there's still people joining the call, I notice. So we're up to two thirds of you. I'll just leave this going for a little longer. Okay, so I'm going to end this now because I think it's fairly clear what the results are going to look like. So I'm afraid uh, some of you may not have been able to vote, but I'll just share the results with you all. So it looks like a lot of you are working with marginalized people or people who have low or no digital skills. And a lot of you are also working in health or care. So in each case, that's over 40% of the people on the call. Um, we've also got a few people who are providing remote digital support or were providing digital support before COVID-19. We hope we can give you some information about how you can continue to do that. Great that we've got 44% of you, 15 people on the call who work in, in health or care specifically. So I hope who, wh whatever reason you've joined this call, I hope we'll be able to share something that's of, of value to you. Really quickly, what's the problem that we're addressing today? Um, Critically, measures that are out there to prevent the virus spread can make accessing health information and services more difficult for people who are digitally excluded. That's why we're having, that's why we were interested to host this event today. Some of the things that we've done in Citizens Online recently, we've created an age and digital exclusion risk map of the GP surgeries in England, which focuses on the roughly 3,600 surgeries which have under 30% of their patients registered for online services or at least had under 30% registered as of February 2020 which was the latest available data from NHS Digital and we've mapped that and looked at the age profile of those GP surgeries with the idea being that it might help to identify places that are at greatest risk of digital exclusion. There's lots of caveats about that and we could talk about it in detail at another time but you can find the information on our website. Another piece of relevant work that we've been doing, which we'll talk about in more detail next week, is a report we uh, were commissioned to do by Public Health England. This was not related to COVID, it was work we did beforehand, but it was about digital exclusion in population health screening programmes, looking at what the impacts might be of channel shift away from printed leaflets and to more online information. And as I say, we'll be talking about that more next week but you can also find the full report on our website if you're interested. So over to Shabira. Hi 
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. So thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about something that I'm really uh, passionate about, and that's health inequalities. Um, I'm Shabira Papain. I've been working to address health inequalities um, for about 15, 20 years. Um, and health inequalities are the unfair or the avoidable um, blocks to accessing healthcare uh, that many populations experience. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit about what I've done where it informs my thinking and then I'll frame for you uh, how you could articulate health inequalities for yourself because it's really important that when you finish this call today you feel um, confident but you have some sort of insight in the work that you do how you can be thinking about health inequalities considerations in all that you do in the decision making uh, within the organizations that you represent. So I, you know, I served my apprenticeship, as I call it, uh, working with grassroots communities in East London, designing public health innovations uh, that were about people taking more control over the health and well-being. And when we think about health inequalities, that's really at the heart. When you've got people being active participants of their health care in whatever setting that may be across the lifespan, then you've got people who are engaged in those decision making uh, processes. But also that means they're taking more control over their life. So I've supported uh, a hospice in East London to diversify its reach. It was sitting in the heart of East London, but only one percent of the patients and I have to tell you it's one of the most stunning hospices so it was so sad that only one percent of the local population was accessing services and so we worked together through listening exercises and through working from the community up to shift that to over 75 percent of the local population were accessing uh, those services and those resources um, and taking more control over the palliative care so that's some of the stuff uh, that I've done more recently I worked in an organization uh, looking at how you can use digital uh, to reduce the gaps in access and we were able to um, ensure that we were reaching those families most at risk of poor outcomes. So for me, digital has an opportunity to democratize access to health literacy, to information. It can be 24 seven, um, it can be cost effective, uh, but it also has an opportunity to increase that digital divide. Um, and at the heart of health inequalities lies access. So health inequalities are things like education, housing. So these are the social things that are not directly related to our health uh, makeup, like our biology or our genetics. That means we're more likely to have poorer outcomes. And so things like your housing, your the kind of job that you have, your education, uh, whether you experience racism, poverty and discrimination, uh, your life chances when you're a young person, those are the things that have adverse impacts on your life and it means and this is a stat and it means that a baby born in Bradford is five times more likely to die in infancy than a baby born in Bath. This is health inequalities. Now I'm sure you've become familiar you're on Twitter or Facebook or you know the whole world that I try to avoid I have to say um, where you're probably hearing that during this COVID pandemic there are particular communities and, uh, and the words going around, BAMI communities, what does that mean? Uh, there are particular communities who fall under this category of BAMI, uh, Black, Asian, uh, mixed race, minority ethnic communities, who've been more at risk of COVID. Um, and you might be asking, well, why, why is that? And so when we think about health inequality, it's those things, it's those social determinants of someone's health. It's the fact that, you know, if you live in a deprived area, that you're more likely to experience poor health outcomes. You are going to experience greater barriers to accessing healthcare. Uh, your housing, you've got poorer housing and, and access to services. It could be transportation, uh, the education that you received or the education that your children are receiving, the kinds of resources that are available in your community. Social support as well, actually, it's an interesting factor. It's another uh, indicator. So, you know, being a migrant in a country where you don't have that social support, that social capital, uh, that has an impact. So as you can see, health inequalities are a mixture of things that are non-health related as well that impact on our lives. So you can't have one 
strategy that's going to magically turn things around. There are multiple strategies and that presents opportunities. And that means for all of you, and just thinking about the kinds of work that you're doing, it means that all of you have an opportunity every day in the work that you're doing to impact on health inequalities. Yeah, I could talk about this all day. So James, you're going to tell me when no. like, Shabira, move on. Yeah, that's perfect, Shabira. So I just put up Shabira's question, which we'll come back to when we have the discussion, which is how do the organisations you represent include the voices of seldom heard communities in design, development and delivery? That won't be the only question that we discuss, but that's something to think about. And if you'd like to offer some thoughts on that in the chat, you're welcome to now. That will help us to identify those of you who might want to speak in the discussion. So I'll now hand over to, to Bob. Thanks, James, and um, it's really great to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, just a quick introduction to myself. So uh, I've uh, been around in, in the world of digital health and digital inclusion for, for quite a while now. I was the strategy director on the NHS website, uh, and then I ran the uh, NHS widening path participation program for, for digital inclusion. I'm now an independent consultant. I'm working with uh, several leading digital inclusion organizations and I was really pleased to work with uh, James and Fran and colleagues at Citizens Online on the uh, uh, equality impact assessment work on, on uh, information about screening which James has mentioned and Looking forward to uh, the uh, webinar about that uh, next week. I'm just going to very quickly uh, share some thoughts with you about the nature of digital exclusion and health and just some examples of ways in which uh, community organisations are tackling some of the challenges of digital exclusion, particularly in the time of, of coronavirus. About 50 years ago now actually a GP in Wales developed a, a concept called the inverse care law and the idea behind that was that the people who most need health care are the least likely to be able to access and use that care and a number of us recently have looked back to Julian Tudor Hart's inverse care law and said haven't we now got uh, a digital inverse care law. As we increasingly deliver information and services digitally, we risk widening health inequalities even further because the social characteristics that mean that people need health care, you know, perhaps they're older or they've got um, chronic illnesses and disabilities or they're living in poor housing, also mean they're less likely to be online. We can move on to the next slide. And that's become really stark in the area uh, of COVID. And we hear sometimes, don't we, that um, COVID-19 is a great leveller. We're all in this together. But actually, that's not at all true. COVID is not an equal opportunities disease. Um, recent ONS data showed that um, uh, COVID has much greater impact on deprived communities than on uh, more affluent communities. You are twice as likely to die of COVID if you live in a deprived area than if you live in one of the, the least deprived areas of the country. It's, it's that stark. And of course, we've read recently a lot around the disproportionate impact on BAME communities um, of, of, of COVID. And of course, the people living in those deprived areas who are suffering the most from the virus are also the people who are most likely to be digitally excluded. And there's, there's a real close alliance between deprivation, COVID risk and um, digital exclusion. And what we're seeing now is that COVID-19 is really exposing digital and data poverty. Those of us who work in digital exclusion all the time will, will, will know that, you know, we've traditionally looked at, you know, the barriers to people getting online being around a lack of digital skills, around a lack of access and affordability, but also around lack of interest and motivation. And I think pre-COVID, there was beginning to be a view that we'd kind of tackled 
digital skills because devices were easier to use and technology was just more familiar to people. And because of the falling costs of technology, access wasn't so much of a problem. And the problem was people weren't motivated. Now, I think COVID has actually flipped that on its head. There's no shortage of motivation to get online in COVID. If you're not online, you're excluded from society. There's masses of motivation. But we're, what we're finding is that digital poverty, lack of ownership of devices, or affordability of data is much more deep rooted perhaps than we really thought. And I think that's been a stark reminder. So going on, I just wanted to look at very quickly at four areas where there's great things going on in communities to tackle what I think are four problems that, that, that we've got in the COVID era. A problem around fake news and misinformation and people who have low health literacy and low digital health literacy are particularly vulnerable to fake news and, and misinformation. We also really need to mobilize the great creativity in communities. And there's some really off the wall examples of that going on. We need to ensure that people can access healthcare remotely and safely. And we need to support the most vulnerable people, particularly those in care homes. So going on to that, tackling fake news and misinformation. There's been an absolute what, what people call an infodemic of misinformation and false news around COVID. You know, Donald Trump recommending you drink bleach, rumors around 5G, people burning down um, telephone masks, even one at the NHS Nightingale Hospital, or the guy who drank fish tank cleaner because that contained. Um, the disinfectant that, that Trump was talking about. Huge growth of those. And I think it's really important that those of us uh, working with people who are less confident in using digital health resources are recommending really reliable and trustworthy sources. And we've got some examples of those towards the end of the webinar and we'll come back to that. So if we can move on. Some great examples of how people really wanting to help in the community, whether they're businesses, voluntary organizations, individual people themselves, are, are lending their expertise to uh, the, 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 the way in which we, we, we manage and live with COVID. Um, trying to tackle this digital poverty and lack of devices. There's, a, there's an initiative, I'm sure many of you know, called devices.now, um, businesses donating devices, to the 1.9 million households who are not connected. We've seen a great upsurge in volunteering. The NHS volunteering app um, developed um, uh, by or using the, the GoodSAM platform. Um, three quarters of a million volunteers. But what we're hearing is that a lot of those volunteers haven't yet had anything to do. And couldn't those volunteers or some of those volunteers be digital champions isn't isn't that a, a marriage waiting to happen the whole volunteering world and the need for digital champions and then finally a lot of digital creativity around uh, the tech force 19 initiative for example where small creative digital startups have bid for small pots of money to get initiatives going to tackle covid and there's just some examples of those there moving on and some of that creative transformation is really interesting the way organizations are doing things really differently you know, we've seen fashion organizations making uh, gowns and masks seen vacuum cleaner companies making ventilators um, perfume manufacturers making um, sanitizers um, and i um, used some of these slides in a webinar I, uh, an international webinar i did for the library community a, a few weeks ago and I, and I was just noticing how libraries, which are closed to the public, have technology. They have 3D printers. And some libraries around the country are using those 3D printers to produce personal protective equipment. So just some creative thinking going on there. Next one. But of course, again, with libraries, services, this is a good illustration, I think, where services don't have to stop 
because their physical environment stops. And although libraries have been closed, actually during March, more people joined their library than any other month. And people were joining their library to have access to uh, e-books and e-magazines. Um, there's a, 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 a YouTube national shelf service that recommends reading for you. So I think the message there is that because um, bricks and mortar organizations are closed, that doesn't mean their services aren't closed and we can do so much digitally. Next one. Of course, when we can't access services physically for our healthcare, it becomes even more important that we're able to use things like online consultations. Now, of course, online consultations, you know, web-based consultations or video consultations have become reasonably common before COVID because they spare people the cost and stress of travel. They've got a good impact on the carbon footprint. Um, uh, some really good reasons for, for, for doing things um, virtually. And, you know, a, a consultant told me recently that you know, many of the face-to-face -face appointments he has, people have traveled, they've taken time off work, they've had to get childcare, they go into a five minute appointment with him and he just says, oh yes, everything looks fine. And, you know, couldn't we do that so much more? And I think in, when we're looking at sustainability of some of these initiatives post COVID, that shift to virtual consultations is gonna be a really significant way in which we build back things better um, and then finally um, supporting the most vulnerable people particularly people in care homes um, two quick initiatives around that firstly providing people in care homes with voice activated devices things like echo uh, amazon echo and google home devices great for people who lack digital skills because they don't need keyboard skills they don't need dexterity they can just do things voice activated they, you know they can set up reminders they can set up um, chats with their friends and family um, now you can access the nhs websites content via um, uh, via alexa so a really good development and then the next thing uh, for vulnerable people on the next slide um, I, I worked for the last couple of years with a great initiative in Wales called Digital Communities Wales and there they were providing residents in care homes with virtual reality headsets to enable them to live a world outside the care home or to reminisce about things in their youth and when older people are isolated in care homes perhaps not even able to have any visitors at all to be able to use those VR headsets to engage with a richer and wider world, I think is a fantastic example of a, a, a technology that's used for, for making things better. And then just my uh, final slide. I think there's some really great examples and I'm looking forward to hearing some things from, from people in the discussion period about where organizations have worked in a multi-agency way across communities to deliver a solution to COVID through digital. And one of my favorites is the 100% Digital uh, Leads Initiative, uh, multi-agency approach, administering grants, distributing technology, making their digital champions training uh, virtual via video, signposting to um, digital tools and resources. And really interestingly, auditing digital access across the city to see where you can still get online because one of the impacts of covid is that all the places or nearly all the places that digitally excluded people used to go to get online cafes libraries uh, are now closed and that shut off a really important means of digital access for people so really important that we know where you can still go and get online maybe a, a public street wi-fi or something like that so that's all i wanted to say i hope that's given a few ideas both of the problem and some of the ways in which people are solving it and really looking forward to the discussion around this thanks james thanks bob that's brilliant um, we'll move on to the group discussion
pretty much on time. We started a bit late, so we're pretty much on time. We've got about half, half a session for discussion. Um, so I'm going to shortly stop sharing my screen and we'll get to see each other. Um, before I do that, I'll just remind you, or Shabira, perhaps you'd like to read out this question. Yeah, but actually I've got another one. I'm so sorry, I'm being completely and utterly naughty. But as Bob was talking, um, I'm reminded, and I, and I know from your experiences, uh, given where you guys are from, that uh, it's easy to start to think that digital exclusion is a generational problem. And it's, you know, our older um, members of the community who are digitally excluded. And some of the examples were had a little bit of that lens. And so I want to remind you that actually digital exclusion uh, maps onto health inequalities and so you think of the education think of all those things migration patterns um, and so I'd like you to think about examples of how you've seen technology help uh, because sharing that with each other could be really useful as well not only seeing the exclusion and I'll, and I'll give you an example um, my son is uh, he's on the autistic spectrum and uh, and so giving really clear instructions is really important and communicating as, as precisely and as simply as possible. Um, and I had a bit of a brain blip. I ended up in hospital in October and I lost the sense of time. And we have an Alexa and I'll just park all the issues with having that kind of technology <laughs> that's listening in. We'll park that one. And I'll tell you the good thing of having an Alexa and how it helped us in our life. Um, and, uh, and supported me as a single mum in a home with two children after my brain was not functioning. And that is, I was able to put some really clear instructions within Alexa to do reminders. And so it said to my son, Jasper, it's time to go brush your teeth. Jasper, it's time. And so I really enhanced my ability to be able to parent with him during a time where he needed real clarity to take him through a process in the morning to get ready for school. And it supported me as someone where I was physically, I was bed bound, but I still needed to be able to, to, to have him be able to get ready for school and feel that I was still there. So I could sit with him without running around. And that's just one of the ways uh, that we use um, digital in our home. And in terms of digital exclusion, the one thing I want to plant for you is you've got to think about it from that neurodiversity that we don't all communicate and we don't all receive information in the same ways. And so how does technology help? Um, and what are the principles that technology must embody um, and hold on to really tightly to make sure that we're opening up those opportunities. So when we do have access to digital, and so, you know, I'm talking about the layer above not being able to afford having Wi-Fi in the house or having digital. What about when we've got it, then it's still got those barriers there. So I want, to think, want you to think about that when you think about this question. So I'd like to know how the organisations that you work in how do you get those, those seldom heard voices? So these could be BME communities. It could be people that live with disabilities or older people. Um, it could be anyone with all the different protected characteristics. But how does your organization include the voices of these seldom heard communities in the work that you do? So in either the designing, in the development of that work and in the delivery of that work. Because if we can start to understand and share this good practice, it's at the heart of being able to do some really innovative things that Bob's talked about today around that digital landscape and around health inequalities. Thanks, Shabira. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen, say hello to everyone, perhaps have a little wave. Nice. A smile. Nice to see you. I see lots of you have your videos um, turned off, which is fine. Um, that's perfectly acceptable if you don't want to be recorded on our video. But if you can turn it on, it's, it's nice to see you. Um, Francis, have you got a question that we could go to first off? Um, yeah, there's a, more of a general one at, f at first from Rose Davidson. Rose, I'm going to unmute you. Bob, you were talking about the um, volunteers who signed up and whether they could um, be connected through to Digital Champions. So Rose, do you want to ask your question about Digital Champions? It's, it's more of a general one, maybe. Yeah, just a, a general one. I just am not familiar with um, what Digital Champion is, what that looks like, how people become a Digital Champion. Okay, I think that's one I can tackle quite quickly. Um, so when we talk about digital champions in Citizens Online, we mean someone who can help someone else access or use some kind of digital device. 
to get someone online or to help them to do more online than they were doing previously. We divide those sorts of people up into three main types when we talk about it, which is volunteer digital champions, people who have offered to do that out of the goodness of their heart. You'll often find people who are volunteers working in libraries, for instance. We also talk about professional digital champions. That's people who are paid specifically to do that work. And we sometimes hire people in that, in that capacity. Um, and then we also talk about a third group, which we think is really important to a sort of systemic um, model of digital inclusion that can make sure that when people who are not online or who are digitally excluded or are having difficulty accessing a service, when that happens, they encounter what we call an embedded digital champion. That's someone whose job is not to do with digital, but is perhaps a frontline worker for another reason and who can triage someone, identify that they have a digital skills need or a digital inclusion need, and who can either support them with that need then and there, or who can at least refer them to um, another organization that can support that person. So th those are those are three types of digital champions. We sometimes also use the term or other organizations use the term to talk about um, what we sometimes also would call digital leaders, people who are in a more strategic, um, who are a senior level of an organization who are championing digital within that organization. And for us, it's important those people are not just championing digital transformation, taking services that have been offline and making them digital, but championing digital inclusion, making sure that in the design of those services, we're thinking about the things that Shabira and Bob have been talking about, making sure that everyone is still access, able to access those services or is involved in the design of them. Thank you. Great. I don't know if Shabira or Bob, you want to add anything or should we move on to another question? We'll move on to another question. Um, so do your organisation... <laughs> use the seldom heard communities like do you get those voices to inform what you're doing is there a yes no maybe yes, maybe we could maybe we could just do a, a in fact i might be able to even make a poll in oh, Zoom and do it live but if we just get a sort of nods and from the people who are on video can you give us a thumbs up if your organization does include those um those groups could you give us a a, a sort of waving hand if you might do a little but not enough and a down if you're not happy with how well you do that okay so we've got a bit of variety i'll try and do that as a poll um shabira so we get a better representation of it and people can of course comment in the chat as well about that does anyone want to talk about how they do that um we don't have to just have questions here we're, we're welcome some contributions about how you've been addressing these issues i'm happy to say Oh, sorry, go on. We've got someone there. So someone started to say something. You're welcome to oh. carry on. I think you then muted yourself again. I think it was Kirsty. Yeah, sorry. I thought Francis was going to say something. I kind of feel if your face is showing, you should get first dibs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm with the Trust of Love. Go on, Kirsty. And we do a variety of things, none of which are perfect or all-encompassing. But um, so because we do community development and youth work in grassroots communities, we would naturally just come into contact with people from other minority groups within that setting. Um, and, we, and we also house the BAME uh, community roots aspects of the social prescribing. So because we do that, we can do cross referrals quite easily between our frontline neighbourhood work and the community roots work. And I'd say what that's taught us is it's really important to do decent referrals and not signposting and to really support people from one service to another. So it's easier, obviously, when in our case, it's one of our services to another one of our services. But I'd say our big learning is also how we work with our partners. So I rely a lot on Speak Out and LGBT Switchboard and Amaze to reach communities that we don't do direct delivery for and to make sure that we're giving them the right supports and they're giving us the right supports and we're cascading information and trust in both directions because people often trust the service that they have most contact with. 
And so we can often broker a relationship with another service. So a lot of our social prescribing is that it is helping somebody go to a neighborhood food bank so that they feel welcome and OK going there. And yes, it does make it easier if they're introducing them to one of their co-workers and going, oh, this is Cesar, you'll be all right here. He's going to sort your food bag out. You know, that does make it easier. So I think the more connected we are and the more we talk to each other as services and don't operate in silos, the easier it is for anyone to engage. And then the other bit we try and do is sort of drill down and do outreach sort of research projects to ask about the additional oh. barriers we're experiencing. So we've just, that's what most of our coronavirus, coronavirus response has been, is to do action research in community settings to ask people about their experiences. And that's what we're doing a lot of at the moment. That's really good. You? I've taken notes, Kirsty. Anyone else with experiences they'd like to share? Hi. So we've got Karen, Karen Graham. Would you like, and then Shazad as well, maybe. So Karen, do you want to say? Yeah. So um, I work for an advocacy organisation, and um, we work in Calderdale with people with learning disabilities and we've really just had to, it's, it's been more about reacting to conversations that we've had with people. Um, you know, so we've identified where some of the gaps have, have been for people as um, service provision has reduced. So just a couple of examples, we've been hosting um, Netflix parties for people that are quite, you know, might live independently. Um, so rather than watching a movie themselves or watching a television program themselves, we've linked them up with other people so that they can, you know, make popcorn or pizza or have a drink or whatever, and they can sit in their own homes, but obviously discuss, you know, what, what they're all watching together, which has been a better experience than people just watching them um, in isolation. Um, a couple of people um, who had service providers who were doing the cooking of the meals for them. We've been doing cooking lessons with them, um, virtual cooking lessons, which have worked really, really well. It's upskilled people. It's given people a lot more confidence in their own ability. Um, and a couple of people are now you know, they don't need us to volunteer and help them and support them. And they're going off and, and they're arranging, um, you know, in their own groups, you know, to do cooking on a weekend, etc., which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Co-production is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we ask people, we ask, we ask people and then that determines what, what we do next. And I think that's, that's really key. We, we don't, as an organisation, we don't have all the answers and I totally agree with the lady before about not working in silo I think that's absolutely key is sharing information and and if you don't know hold your hands up and go I don't know it scared me coming on to this call I've got to say because I'm not technology absolutely scared, scares the life out of me um, but I'll embrace it and I see the value of it particularly around health inequalities we're really, really pushing for that. And we see, we don't see barriers, we see solutions. And it's about how do we work together to overcome some of that stuff. Can I just ask a question? How did you do the Netflix party? Was it like you go on a Zoom and then you show the film? Yeah, well, I can't take credit for oh, that. Sorry. It's my colleague's 11 year old son. And the thing about being in lockdown is when people are with families, Whereas if you were in an office or something, you might say to a colleague, oh, I've got this bit of an issue. Or I've got something that I don't know what to do. Well, Tracy, Tracy was saying that with a family and 11 year old son went, oh, I know how to do that. So he did it as a school project as well, which was fantastic because that was giving him a purpose and something to do. And he helped us massively as an organization, you know, to help people connect right. a bit more. That's good. That's, that's really interesting. And it, it reminds me to say something about um, digital champions. You know, I talked about that in quite a formal way in the way that we talk about it as an organization. And when we're working with 
third sector or private sector or public sector organizations but actually a lot of the digital support that happens in the world all the time but certainly during covid has been very informal it's within families and it, there's an argument that those people are digital champions you know it's yeah. there's a there's an issue there in terms of the training those people have and and whether they're they're passing on how to do something in a way that they figured out how to do it than rather than necessarily a safe or the best way or the easiest way but um certainly there's a lot of creativity happening in those settings as well which is great um, I'm going to launch this poll just so we get a bit some better answers about um, Shabira's question. So it's got multiple options. So it's do the organizations you represent include the voices of seldom heard communities in design, in development, in delivery, or not well in any area? And if you're doing it in to some extent in each area, you're welcome to, to say that. It'd be interesting to see whether there's any kind of difference in where you feel you include those voices. Um, and then after that, I think we will go to um, Shazad, was it, Francis? Yeah, I can see the question. Yeah. So I'll just leave this and see if we can get as many votes as possible. So we're over half of you now, but still a few to come. Um, while we're doing this, another thing that's worth saying about digital champions is that we really emphasize that you don't have to be an IT whiz to be a digital champion. A lot of being a digital champion is about it's what we might call softer skills around supporting someone to achieve an objective. The key skills that you might have as a digital champion is an ability to know how to find out the answer to a question that someone has, which could be knowing your way around the digital champions network that um, Digital Unite provide all the guides that they provide. It's not about having to learn everything there is to know about the internet and then being able to pass that on to people. It's about being able to hear what someone's need is and identify how you might find a solution with them and enable them to solve their own problems in future as well. Okay, so I think that's probably all the votes we'll get in because some people might be on phones and unable to vote. So we've got 30 out of 44 of you who've voted and the results say that most people are including voices in the development stage. Um, lots of people, including people in a delivery level, um, about half compared to 70% for in development and a, a lower proportion around 40%, not significantly lower than delivery, but in design. I think that's interesting because arguably it's most important to include people in the design stage, but obviously that is potentially a more difficult stage to do that and do it well um, I don't know if Shabira you'd like to respond to these results a little and Bob as well if you like well the reason to be included in there is you know 45 minutes to talk about a massive topic which is health inequalities and digital inclusion or exclusion um, is insufficient right we've already been speaking about it for almost that time and we're only like just scratching at the surface so the reason I, I wanted to pose that question is I want you to reflect on your own practice to really shift inequalities and really it's like an ask back to you guys you've shown an interest by joining this webinar you've taken out the 45 minutes in your day to go I'm, I'm interested in this and I want to know more um, and I'm hoping that you're going to connect with each other that by sharing practice you start to see you know it's what Karen said looking at solutions looking at beyond and around um, you can't escape that uh, exclusion and inequalities are at the heart of what's going on in the world right now you can't escape it because if you look anything outside your front door it's there and it's up to each one of us when there's appetite for change when there's appetite to do good things in the world it's up to you to think about well what are the micro things that i could be doing in my organizations so that question was there to get you to reflect on you know where is it that we're at where do we want to go what can i do in my role to support reducing those inequalities because as i've said to you at the very beginning inequalities aren't something that the health system on its own can address it's through people like you. It's through you and your community networks. It's through the communities that you're serving. It's bringing their voices to the heart of decision-making from design to delivery to implementation and reflecting and evaluating. Um, and data is really important. If we had more time, I, I'd want to unpick with you 
what kind of data you're collecting and how you're using that data to inform decision making because data it's not good collecting data you're not doing anything with then don't collect it this is people's lives but using data in meaningful ways to help you think about what's going on in the world to help whether that world is just the world that you're navigating in or the wider macro environment that we're all in um but data can enrich your practice so as smaller grassroots organizations make sure you've got that data and that you tell the world put it out there because i tell you from doing lots of literature reviews and trying to share things within nhsx these things that you're doing that you because you just that's just your business as usual uh, kirsty and karen that is dynamite that's lots of learning so share it with each other and be really proud of it and then do more of it but evaluate it as well share that data tell everyone how you did a netflix party and that this 11 year old helped support you know this to happen and that there's these cooking skills and you know kirsty your reflections about making sure that you join up the services you know that's a no-brainer for you but actually we need to make sure that people are hearing this and and that's why i posed this because we've got this tiny bit of time but i want you to go off into the world in your zoom world net you know google hangouts whatever your you know it's inflicted upon you day after day having to sit in front of your computer uh i want to have something in you that is reflecting and thinking about it and um so that you feel like you can take action because that is what is needed right now Brilliant. Thanks, Shabira. Any more on that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly from me, um, I think that this, this whole thing about the importance of involving your end users, in, in, in particular some of the um, more deprived populations around your design and development, links very closely to this issue of motivation. You know, I talked about people being highly motivated at the moment to get online and do things. Might be more to do... Um, you know, Netflix parties and whatever than to, to, to access digital health resources. But in the longer term, I, there's still plenty of examples of where um, the NHS is, is particularly bad at this, actually, where they've, they've put out digital health tools that don't reflect people's priorities and interests, haven't involved end users in their design and development. And then... Um, you know, it's not surprising that people aren't motivated to use them. You know, in my work, I've heard quite often, you know, you, you got me online, you taught me digital skills, you got, you got me using resources. And then when I started using them, I was really disappointed because it, it, they weren't for me. And, you know, it's absolutely crucial that we um, do these things through principles of co-production with end users. So that motivation's there and, and, uh, resources meet people's needs. I'm Thanks, sorry, um, James, we didn't go back to Shazad. That's what I was just going to do. So oh, just okay, before, before we start to wrap up, I'm just going to unmute yeah. Shazad to talk about what you've been doing. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I, I work with a service uh, called the Haringey Thinking Space, which is commissioned through uh, Tavistock and Portman. So it's a, um, the, the, the premise of the service comes from the 2011 riots where there was a, a civil unrest in a, in a community in Haringey. So the service de de decided to create a platform where the community members can um, share their um, conflict and challenges that they, they were encountering uh, from the aftermath of the actual riots and, and how much of a traumatic experience um, it was and, and how it affected their lives. So through, through this, um, we've been doing, uh, the service was um, started at the end of 2012. I've been with them for the last two years and um, I, I co-facilitate my groups. So our um, demographic is literally the community. So we, we have several um, uh, different challenges where we do have people that sometimes come that have language barriers, um, but they still want to have a voice. They want to. They want to be heard. They want to tell their story. Um, so recently, um, October last year, we started a, an, another project, which is another space for the homeless, which is a, another um, seldom heard community that I feel that we need to include in this. And I, I do feel that during this period, soon soon as the lockdown came in, we had to cease the service. So we've lost a, a whole demographic of people that are homeless and um, uh, have very little resources. So 
it's, it's, it's a big challenge and it's got me reflecting and I, I'm thinking moving forward, I, I did want to flag this up um, internally anyway with, with my service, but um, I'm thinking it as a, as a whole, um, if, so if this is happening in Haringey, how widespread is this? You know, and I, and I also think um, what protocols could be put into place where there could be a, a digital presence and support for those who have very little in that respect. So, um, yeah, and also our main group that runs um, with adults on uh, Tuesdays have now reduced um, significantly to uh, half of, of what we normally have because we normally have a physical, physical space. And for the same reasons, the participants that don't have much access to technology have had a, re a reduction in service. So they have either been um, using the phone calls like in, in our session here now, or um, they've had to email and communicate by other means. So it is, it is quite a challenge. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thanks, Shazad. I, I sadly don't think we're going to have much time to reflect on what you've just said, but that's really useful contribution. I will say to everyone, you know, as, as Shabir has noted and lots of you have noted in the chat, 45 minutes is a very short time to address these issues. And one of the reasons for covering a similar topic next week is that we can hope to continue the conversation a bit then. So I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, before we start doing wrap up slides, I think, Francis, you mentioned there's one other question that we can hope to cover as we do that. Yeah, I'm just going to read this one out, sorry, um, from Jordan. Do you have any suggestions for types of events that would capture those digitally excluded communities once lockdown eases? Um, part of our pilot role is to engage with people in GP surgeries, but that isn't a possibility right now. So that's something we might be able to just get, get in the wrap up is um, what about keeping on do, <laughs> doing this once lockdown eases? Yeah, that's a great. So thank question. you. There's been some really good thank questions you. and points in the chat. Thanks, everyone. So, and, and it's really good uh, reminder for me to say if you have ideas about that question, if you have any other resources or things that have come up for you, if you want to say anything about this session, anything that we've missed that you'd like us to cover next time or things like that, then please do put it in the chat now and we'll, I'll circulate an edited version of that chat later for everyone, which will just be a focus on the, the, the resources and things like that and questions. And I'll try to answer that we haven't had, had time for. So I'm just going to go through some tips and resources, which starts with you, Shabira. Yeah, so this was more about um, equipping you with some underlying principles about how to uh, communicate, because some of you are already doing this. Um, some of you're really doing this work. So it's just giving a language really, so you can go back to your organizations and go, hey, you know, and I've heard this other organizations doing that there and they're doing it with here. Um, and it's the principles that underpin everything that we're doing. So it's about actively listening and seeking those voices that are underrepresented. Don't stay in a room with people who all agree with what you're saying. Invite that multiple perspective. For your life, this is good, but for reducing inequalities, it's imperative. Um, engage with people at that local level, like the examples that we heard um, colleagues share today, uh, just so rich. Find ways of feeding those up and sharing those, those stories and the ways that you do this. What you're hearing, don't take it for granted. How precious what you're hearing from your grassroots communities truly are. Um, I put my email on the chat and I don't usually do that because I'm usually so overwhelmed with emails, but genuinely I put my email on there. If you want to share some of those stories, I'm going to find a way to see how we can gather that together and then we can give it back uh, to everybody, but so that we can do that. So I practice what I preach and then share that back at national level. So, you know, make sure you tell me who your organizations are piggyback so that goes to the question that was just raised that we flagged piggyback on good work that's already happening don't try to scratch things start things from scratch try to piggyback on what works you know find out from colleagues why that worked share that good practice uh, with other teams um, localities it's what Kirsty said about don't work in silos that not just about not working in silos in organizations don't work in silos across the sector and across sectors and across regions and localities um strive for services and products that you grow together again it's making sure that for that person on the ground who's having to walk through that journey 
that it feels like there's, you know, we're all talking to each other and that there's alignment. And if you're creating products, and I mean, this really is for the NHS um, more than anything because of the hugest of service providers, it's making sure that things are aligned. So these are principles that I've, I've been playing with inside the organization and talking to colleagues about. Um, and then I guess at the heart of everything, when you're doing something, be thoughtful and mindful about whether you're doing things to people or whether you're working alongside with people, but aim to create agency rather than doing stuff to people. It's the example that Karen gave about um, cooking lessons. You can either keep delivering food or you can do things so that people can get food themselves. And so it's finding those examples all the time, just because there's goodwill, it's the right thing to be doing. The thing about agency, thinking about how you can give power to people to do things for themselves. Brilliant. Thanks, Shabira. And then, Bob, do you want to talk through these um, health information ones? Just really quickly, because I'm conscious of your time, um, just a couple of resources I particularly wanted to draw attention to. I think, you know, you've got the others in, 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 the, um, in the list of resources. Um, really great uh, resource from World Health Organization called Mythbusters, and that most days takes a current myth around um, coronavirus and gives some pretty simple digestible information about that. You can get that uh, via WhatsApp. You can also go onto the WHO uh, website for that and the, uh, the address is there. And uh, secondly, just if, if, um, if you don't do anything else, go to the NHS website, NHS UK, where I used to work. Um, really interesting to see uh, during March, uh, there's usually a million visits a day to that website, which is pretty massive already. But during March, it went up to two million visits a day. And that extra activity was almost entirely to coronavirus content. And really interesting to see at the Prime Minister's um, daily briefing uh, for a couple of weeks, they had the NHS website URL on the podium. So great to see that kind of thing being promoted. So that's all I wanted to say, really, James, on that. Yeah. Mention these others on here. You've got Doctors of the World, which provide a lot of translated guidance. You've got the ORCA um, system for evaluating health apps and sort of giving some um, approval to them or um, verification about their value. And there's also the NHS apps library, which includes Baby Buddy, which is an app that Shabira has worked on around supporting people through pregnancy and um, early parenting. So really quickly, again, to remind you, we have this GP map you might want to have a look at in terms of digital exclusion around health in your area. You can zoom in and have a look around. There's three reports, which I'm sure most of you have heard of at least one of these um, recently. There's the PHE report into disparities in the risk and outcomes of COVID-19, which highlights the higher risks for older people, for black people and other people of color, the AME communities and for a range of other um, what we might what were called inclusion health groups people who are homeless and things like that there's also a report produced by the new economics foundation with migrants organized and med act which looks at migrants access to healthcare during the coronavirus crisis covers some of what happened in our session that migrants organized attended on english as an additional language and talking about some of the the health barriers the service barriers that people face but there's also a strong emphasis on digital inclusion in that report which migrants organizers also talked about they were raising money for smartphones for the people they work with. Finally, the um, Royal College of Physicians has produced a report together with Public Health England and uh, the NHS providers, which is about COVID-19 and mitigating the impact on health inequality specifically, which is where that little um, Venn diagram in the corner comes from. We've got our page of coronavirus support resources, which is largely around digital. I don't think we've got a digital health section yet, but we'll try and put that together. We've got some information that will come round to you in the slides about avoiding scams, generally from Age UK, specifically around COVID from which, and there's also a fact-checking site in Fitagen, which which tackles that sort of stuff specifically. The questions about digital champions are best answered by looking at Digital Unite, one of our partner organisations. They are offering free digital champion training during the coronavirus crisis. They've got top tips for people who are working remotely as digital champions who may not have been doing that previously. And they've got lots of guides and resources specific to the kinds of digital services people might need help with. 
Next time, as I mentioned previously, we'll be talking about how digital transformation can affect health screening tests and looking at the question of what a digital equality impact assessment is. It's a question that we had to ask ourselves and we had to work out what that might look like. We'll be talking about how we approached that and what we found and what we recommended to Public Health England with regard to their, their channel shift program around um, health information leaflets, but we hope it's relevant to the questions of digital health more broadly. It's also worth saying that you can find our previous sessions where you can also register on our website, citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events. And a few are worth particularly mentioning as a result of this conversation. So we did run a session on English as an additional language where we touched on issues faced by migrants in particular. We also ran a session or we've run a couple of sessions around disability and accessibility. One for Global Accessibility Awareness Day, particularly around designing services to be accessible and one with an organization called Diversity and Ability. We do a lot of work with disabled people, but also with home lived people with lived experience of homelessness. That session might be really helpful to many of you in terms of making remote support sessions meaningful and accessible to those people. So thank you all so much for coming and thanks to everyone who stayed on a bit longer. I'm, ap I'm apologizing, we've gone quite a bit over time today and apologizing once again for the password issue that we had right at the beginning. Um, Shabira, if you're happy to, I can include your email when I send people the follow-up so that they, they get it that way, just in case people haven't been able to pick it out of the chat. Um, so I'll end it there. Say thanks to everyone. Hopefully we can get a wave and a smile from you. Um, do please come again next week and we can continue the conversation. And please do email us with any questions that, you, that we haven't been able to address today.